Well, our reading this afternoon is from Romans 8. I tried to edit this. How do you edit Romans 8? You don't. So I'm going to read Romans chapter 8. Take out your Bibles, please. And I remind you that as we come to the word, that this is God's word. Romans chapter 8. Therefore, there is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus, because through Christ Jesus, the law of the spirit of life set me free from the law of sin and death. For what the law was powerless to do in that it was weakened by the sinful nature God did by sending his own son in the likeness of sinful man to be a sin offering. And so he condemned sin in sinful man in order that the righteous requirements of the law might be fully met in us who do not live according to the sinful nature, but according to the spirit. Those who live according to the sinful nature have their mind set on what the, that nature desires. But those who live in accordance with the spirit have their mind set on what the spirit desires. The mind of sinful man is death, but the mind controlled by the spirit is life and peace. The sinful mind is hostile to God. It does not submit to God's law, nor can it do so. Those controlled by the sinful nature cannot please God. You, however, are controlled not by the sinful nature, but by the spirit. If the spirit of God lives in you, and if anyone does not have the spirit of Christ, he does not belong to Christ. But if Christ is in you, your body is dead because of sin, yet your spirit is alive because of righteousness. And if the spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead is living in you, he who raised Christ from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies through his spirit who lives in you. Therefore, brothers, we have an obligation, but it is not to the sinful nature to live according to it. For if you live according to the sinful nature, you will die. But if by the spirit you put to death the misdeeds of the body, you will live. Because those who are led by the spirit of God are sons of God. For you did not receive a spirit that makes you a slave again to fear, but you received the spirit of sonship. And by him we cry, Abba, Father. The spirit himself testifies with our spirit that we are God's children. Now, if we are God's children, then we are heirs, heirs of God and co-heirs with Christ. If indeed we share in his sufferings in order that we may also share in his glory. I consider that our present sufferings are not worth comparing with the glory that will be revealed in us. The creation waits in eager expectation for the sons of God to be revealed for the creation was subjected to frustration, not by its own choice, but by the will of the one who subjected it in hope that the creation itself will be liberated from its bondage to decay and brought into the glorious freedom of the children of God. We know that the whole creation has been groaning as in the pains of childbirth right up to the present time. Not only so, but we ourselves who have the first fruits of the spirit, we groan inwardly as we wait eagerly for our adoption as sons, the redemption of our bodies. For in this hope we were saved, but hope that is seen is no hope at all. Who hopes for what he already has? But if we hope for what we do not yet have, we wait for it patiently. In the same way the Spirit helps us in our weakness, we don't know what we ought to pray for, but the Spirit himself intercedes for us with groans which words cannot express. And he who searches our hearts know the minds of the Spirit, because the Spirit intercedes for the saints in accordance with God's will. And we know. And we know that in all things, God works for the good of those who love him, who have been called according to his purpose. For those God foreknew, he also predestined, to be conformed to the likeness of his son, that he might be the firstborn among many brothers. And those he predestined, he also called. Those he called, he also justified. Those he justified, he also glorified. What then shall we say in response to this? If God is for us, who can be against us? He who did not spare his own son, but gave him up for us all, how will he not also along with him graciously give us all things? 
who will bring any charge against those whom God has chosen. It is God who justifies. Who is he that condemns? Christ Jesus, who died, more than that, who was raised to life, is at the right hand of God and is also interceding for us. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall trouble or hardship or persecution or famine or nakedness or danger or sword? As it is written, for your sake we face death all day long. We are considered as sheep to be slaughtered. No, in all these things we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. For I am convinced that neither death nor life Neither angels nor demons, neither the present nor the future, nor any powers, neither height nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus our Lord. And may God bless to us this reading, his holy word, and to his name be the glory and the praise. Uh, we come before you, our Heavenly Father, as people in need. We need to hear this truth, which is discerned spiritually, and we need your Holy Spirit to help us understand it in that way. Uh, very, for very many of us, our eyes are blind very often, and our ears are stopped up. But your Spirit can uncover blind eyes and unstop deaf ears, and we pray that he'll do that this afternoon. Speak to us, our Heavenly Father, through your word. Your word alone is truth. And we thank and praise you that we have a letter like this, that we have a chapter like this, full of truth, which is for our good and our soul's health. So encourage and lift up those who are downhearted today. All of us need encouragement. And Heavenly Father, bring to conviction those who are arrogant and proud, we pray. You know where we've come from. You know the state of our lives. Speak to us in the way which is just right for us today, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. I was with our 17-year-old adolescent son, six foot four. It was just before Christmas. We were walking in the local mall and he was doing what most adolescents do. He was asking me for money. <laughs> Flippantly, we walked past Santa Claus and I said to Luke, why don't you go and line up with the mothers and children and get on Santa's knee and I'll give you 50 bucks. <laughs> Here is the result. Oh, there it is. <laughs> and that is the photo which graces uh, the sideboard in our home. A six foot, four inch young man dribbling his knees over Santa's knees and Santa looking rather bewildered, I think, by the whole experience. Thanks very much. Now that's the problem, isn't it, with an adolescent. An adolescent wakes up in the morning and he finds that he's got an adult body. You can take that photo down, I think it's a bit deflecting. Uh, he wakes up and he's finds he's got an adult body, but he's not yet adult. And so it's a matter of catch up. His body is mature. His body is far more mature than he is. But he is not mature and he must catch up emotionally to where his physical development has taken him. And perhaps it takes years. And for some, maybe it never happens. Germaine Greer thought it didn't. Germaine Greer said little girls grow up to be women. Little boys grow up to be six foot two. <laughs> but where does maturity come from? Where does spiritual maturity come from? The enemy of spiritual maturity, of course, is sin. And particularly pride. It is that complete anti-God attitude, C.S. Lewis said, which is pride. It exalts itself. It bears its fist at God. It says, we want the blessings that you give. We just don't want you. And that is pride. We turn to Hollywood, don't we, and look for maturity. What does Hollywood say? One film, the fellow brings a young boy along. Uh, adolescent male, I give you the boy, you give me the man. What will turn the boy into a man according to Hollywood? Grog, cigar, illicit sex. What foolishness this is. But that's what we drink in through Hollywood all the time. My favourite animal in the Kruger National Park when I'm on safari is the giraffe. The giraffe is great to look at. Lions love giraffes. They love them for different reasons than I do. <laughs> they love the meat. 
But the giraffe has got three things going for it over the line. Number one, it's got very strong hind legs, and if you get behind it, you're a goner. Number two, it is well camouflaged, and lions don't have great seeing. And thirdly, thirdly it's got a big picture. It sees the lion coming from a distance. It is high up, and the giraffe can see the lay of the land very clearly in front of it. I want to suggest to you this afternoon that in Romans 8, God is giving us the, uh, Paul is giving us the giraffe view. He's giving us the big picture of maturity. And he does it in a triune way, three periods of time and three persons involved. He says, if you're going to be mature, you need to understand something about your past. You need to understand something about the present and you need to understand something about the future. And without each of those, you will not be mature or maturing. You need to understand what God the Son has done with your past. You need to understand what God the Holy Spirit is doing in your present. And you need to understand what God the Father is doing with your future. And that is what Paul is saying here. If you have your outlines open on page 15 of your booklet and your Bibles open there at Romans chapter 8, let's look first of all at verses 1 to 4 where Paul talks about what our Lord Jesus, God the Son, has done with our past. He starts with these great words, Therefore there is now no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus. How did we get to this position? Well, he's already told us. But he says in verse 3 that the law was no help. The law was weakened, he says, by the sinful nature. The law told me what I should do, but I couldn't do it because I'm a sinful person. But God did by sending his own son in the likeness, but not as a sinful man, to be a sin offering. And so he condemned sin in sinful man. He came in the likeness of sinful man to be a sin offering for us. What the law could not do, the Lord Jesus did. How did he do it? Verse 4 tells you. He fulfills the righteous requirements of the law. Jesus lived a perfect life. At every point at which I break, transgress God's law, Jesus fulfills God's law. And then he gives himself as a sin offering. He dies to pay the penalty of broken law, though he has never broken the law. And he does that on behalf of of sinful human beings. He offers to God a perfect life. And Paul says, verse 2, because of that, those who live by the Spirit are set free from the law of sin and death, and they have no condemnation, verse 1, before God. Because one has lived a perfect life, and one has died a substitutionary death. And yet in Australia, we keep propounding this ridiculous, foolish idea. God helps those who help themselves. Oh, let's go on a pilgrimage. Oh, let's climb on our knees. We'd rather eat dirt. We'll do anything but rely on the fact that Jesus has done everything. And God has done everything and leaves nothing, nothing to my pride to boast in, nothing. I need to know if I'm going to be mature, that my past has been dealt with and there's not a lot in my past of which I can be proud. My past was flying from San Francisco to Washington. Sitting next to him was a young man with his young son on his knee. So what have you been doing? I've been from Washington to San Francisco to see my parents to introduce them to their new grandson. What do you do in Washington, my pastor said. I work for the Justice Department. What do you do with the Justice Department? I work in the Nazi research unit. What? You're still looking for Nazis from World War II? We are. Are you still finding them? We are. And what happens when you go to the door and knock on the door? He said, invariably, we find very aged people who are just so relieved to see us because they've been carrying the weight of guilt and they want to deal with it now. They want to somehow get it off their shoulders. And verses 1 to 4 tells me that there's no condemnation for me before God, but there is no necessary, real, rational reason for you, friend, to bear the weight of guilt of your past. It has been laid totally, fully and completely on Jesus and so to be mature and to be a maturing believer, you need to know that the devil's the accuser. He doesn't need any help from you. 
The past has been dealt with. Jesus has done it. God the Son. Well, you say, well, that's all very well, but I've got to live day to day. How does God resource me? Does he leave me empty handed in this battle that I'm involved with against the flesh? No, the Apostle Paul now moves on to God, the Holy Spirit. And from verse 5 to verse 27, there are more references just in this one section of Romans to the Holy Spirit than all the rest of Romans altogether. The Christian life is a matter of give and take. God takes our sin and deals with it, and God gives to us the gift of the Holy Spirit. So he says here in verse 9, you, however, are controlled not by the sinful nature, but by the Spirit, if the Spirit of God lives in you. And if anyone doesn't have the Spirit of Christ, he doesn't belong to Christ. So if you do belong to Christ, you have the Spirit of Christ. We can't see him. He is a spirit. He is a person. But it doesn't mean he is not real. He is there. He is living within me. God is living in me. How do I get the Holy Spirit? By coming to Jesus. That's what Spurgeon said. I looked for the dove and it flew away. I looked to the cross and the dove flew into my heart. You come to Jesus. Paul finds the disciples of John the Baptist. They've never even heard of the Holy Spirit. So Paul tells them about Jesus. He doesn't tell them about the Holy Spirit. You come to Jesus and you receive the Holy Spirit. One day I was out preaching at a church. It was Pentecost Sunday. I'd cleared forgotten that it was Pentecost Sunday, but the church hadn't. They had a windmill. They had flames of fire. The pastor was dressed up in white with red tongues. It was a big day. I thought, crumbs, I haven't got a sermon on the Holy Spirit. And then I thought, but the Pentecostal sermon was not about the Holy Spirit. Acts chapter 2 is all about Jesus. You come to Jesus and you'll receive his spirit. And what will happen? What will the spirit do for you? Number one. Now, here's a good one, isn't it? If you're an oldie. Verse 11. If the spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead is living in you, he who raised Christ from the dead will give life to your mortal bodies through his spirit who lives in you. But verse 10 says, if Christ is in you, your body is dead because of sin, but your spirit is alive because of righteousness. My body is getting old. My wife said the other day when she walked past the mirror, who is that old person in there? (laughs) That's us. Your body's getting old. And those of you in your 20s, it's not long, let me tell you. (laughs) But you're getting young. If you've got the spirit in you, because he is invigorating you. He is making you young. He is getting you ready for eternity. If the spirit that raised Jesus from the dead lives in you, that same spirit who raised our Lord Jesus bodily from death lives in me. And he invigorates and pours life into me, spiritual life. Verses 12 to 14. The second thing he does is that he leads us in holiness. He's Holy Spirit. Therefore, brothers, we have an obligation, but it is not to the sinful nature to live according to it. I can remember when I was an adolescent and I was swept along by my peer group and I can remember vaguely my father saying to me, if something terrible were happened to you, who'd look after you? Well, you and mum, I suppose. Do you think your mates at school would? No, I don't think so. Now, you're right, your mother and I would, because we love you the most. So who do you think you should listen to the most, therefore? (laughs) Now, I thought that was, that's pretty logical. I tried it on our youngest, it didn't work at all. (laughs) But see, what do you owe to the sinful nature? When was the last time you gave in to the sinful nature and the sinful nature said, come on, do it, and you gave in, you said, yes, that was terrific. It's like a speculative mining company. Invest in us and we'll pay a big dividend. Come on, invest more. Come on, invest more. Don't do it. See what Paul says? You owe no obligation to the sinful nature. You don't owe anything to it. And therefore, Johnny Cash's favourite verse, look at verse 13. If you live according to the sinful nature, you'll just end up dying. It'll destroy you. But if by the spirit you put to death the misdeeds of the body... Then you live because those who are led by the spirit of God are sons of God. The Holy Spirit leads me. John White, when he wrote his book on Christian living, he called it the fight. But you're not alone. The Holy Spirit leads me to say no 
to the acts of the sinful nature. No, I won't do it. I owe you no obligation. I've been fooled too often. No. Oh, it's appealing. No, because it's destructive. I sat in a university group, AFES group, university students. I was sort of sitting out of the group and, over, and listening to them as they were doing a Bible study. The question was, how can we have more victory over sin? And so read the Bible more, good. Pray more, good. Fellowship and make ourselves accountable to, to one another more, good, good. Anything else? Silence. Anything else? Silence. Right, well, let's move on to the next question. Do you know that there is a triune God? Do you know that there is a third person of the Holy Trinity and he is called the Holy Spirit? And he is being given by God to you to lead you to say no to sin. Don't you think it's healthy to, to develop an awareness of him and a confidence in him that at that moment where you find sin so appealing, it is the Holy Spirit, your hidden friend, who's called alongside of you, who says, don't do it. He leads you, he says, verse 14. Those who are led by the Spirit of God are the sons of God. Recognise his leading. And then the Holy Spirit also thirdly reminds us that we are adopted into the family of God. For you did not receive a spirit that makes you a slave again to fear, but you received the spirit of sonship. And by him we cry, Abba, Father. Yes, you are sons. Ladies, if that offends you, get over it. Because I'm part of the bride of Christ. And I'm not offended by that. You are sons with the full rights of heirs, co-heirs, everything Jesus inherits from the Father, you inherit from the Father. And you have this inestimable ability now that the Holy Spirit tells you that you can call God by the most intimate term, Abba, Father. He reminds you that you are part of God's family. What is it that Packer said, page 257 of Knowing God? When you get a free moment during the day, remind yourself of who you are. I am a child of God. God is my father. Heaven is my home. Every day is one day nearer heaven. My saviour is my brother. And every Christian is my brother or sister too. That's the Holy Spirit reminding you. You're a member of the family. And fourthly, verse 23, the Holy Spirit, the Apostle Paul says, not only so, but we ourselves who have the first fruits of the Spirit grown inwardly as we wait eagerly for our adoption as sons, the redemption of our bodies. The Holy Spirit is your down payment on heaven. It's old fashioned, isn't it? In the old days before credit cards, you used to go and get lay buys. You'd lay a good buy. You, you might want a suit. Can I lay it by? You'd pay 10%. That was the down payment. And you'd keep going back and you'd keep paying it off. You didn't pay exorbitant interest on it, by the way. Now, of course, you just buy it on your credit card and you pay exorbitant interest on it. But the first payment on the suit was your down payment. And see what Paul is saying here in verse 23. The Holy Spirit in you is your down payment on heaven. He is the eternal washing at your shore. Here he is. And he, when you groan, because life is a groaning experience, look at verse 22, all creation is groaning. It is sick of the cycle of being generated, depreciated and dying and then being generated again. It's sick of it. And we ourselves, verse 23, oh, we rejoice, but we find that there are times when we groan inwardly as we await for the adoption of our sons because we see the tragedies and sufferings of life. And we say, come, Lord Jesus, I'm groaning. Creation groans. We groan. We've received the down payment. We've received the 10%. We want the other 90%. We want the reunion with all Christ's, with Christ himself. We want the tears and the pain to have been gone. We groan. Creation groans. And the spirit groans, verse 26, because sometimes we just don't know how to pray. And that most moving occasion yesterday afternoon what do you pray well the spirit knows and he intercedes verse 26 with groans that words cannot express 
You need to know that your past is dealt with because of what Jesus has done. You need to know that God has given you his Holy Spirit and the Holy Spirit is reinvigorating you. He is leading you in holiness. He is reminding you that you are God's child and he is the down payment on heaven. And even as you groan, he groans on your behalf to a heavenly father. And you need to know that God the Father has your future secure. Look at the words. No more comforting words in all of scripture. And we know. And we know that in all things, things are not out of control. God works for the good of those who love him. Notice it does not say all things have a way of working out. It says God is at work in all things. What things is God at work at? Look at verse 35. He's at work in trouble. He's at work in hardship. He's at work in persecution. He's at work in famine. He's at work in our nakedness and extreme need. He's at work in danger. And he is at work in sword. There is no universal principle here. I had a grandmother who used to dabble in Christian science and she used to, whenever there was a crisis, she'd run, it'll be all right, she'd say. She'd run around, everything will be all right. God is good, Every, everything will turn out okay. That's not what the Apostle Paul is saying here because he qualifies this great truth. He will not allow us to water this truth down. It is such a great truth to know that God is in control of all things. Paul says... These are those who know that God is in control of all things. For those, he says, he describes us from a human point of view, who love him. And then he describes us from a divine point of view. You see, in the original Greek, what he does is he describes those for whom God thus works for good in all things. This is what he says. For those who love him, and then the principle that God is at work in all things, and then the other side of the sandwich is that those who are called according to his purpose. So Paul won't allow us to universalise this. He protects the principle. This is for God's people. This is for those who love God. This is for those who've been called according to God's purpose. For those, they know that God is at work in all things for their good. For the others, tragically, they're like sheep without a shepherd. Luck reigns, chance but we have the great privilege of knowing that for those who love him have been called according to his purpose. He's at work in all things for our good. And what is the good? Well, here is the second qualifier. Is it my health and wealth? Well, I may well doubt that he's at work then for good in all things. No, and not necessarily in things that please me. Look, Paul takes us back to eternity past. For those God foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his son. Now, I know there'll be people who say, oh, yeah, you believe in that predestination business. You're a Presbyterian. <laughs> oh, righto, righto. Well, rip that bit out of your Bible, okay? What are you going to do with that? That's what I'd like to know. It's there. Well, what do you reckon that means? Those for God foreknew, that means that before I was a speck of existence, before my great, 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 great grandfather even existed, God knew that I would exist and I would know him. That's what it means. Well, Paul's wrong there. Well, you wait for tomorrow. If you think Paul's wrong here, <laughs> you'll think he's really hit the heresy trail. <laughs> it's, it's there. Those God foreknew, he gave a destiny, predestined. And what was the destiny? To be conformed to the likeness of his son. That we might be, that, sorry, that he might be, Jesus, the firstborn among many brothers of those who follow him, who are growing to be like him, who are examples of the new humanity. Now, that is what Paul is saying here. This is God's agenda, therefore. This is God's agenda for me. We go to meetings with great long agendas. God's got two items on his agenda for you. One, that you come to know Christ. Two, that you grow to be like Christ. That's it. He drew me to him. I came to know him. He foreknew me. He predestined me. He called me. I came to know him in all his grace. And now he's at work in everything to make me like his son, who is the model of maturity, who is the new humanity. 
and we are growing to be like the new humanity, like Christ. Have you got enemies? When I was at our college, we had enemies. They lived around us in the streets. They thought we shouldn't be there. I remember one day a man saying, I'll fight you with my dying breath. I thought I'd better not say this to him, but I thought that you do your worst to me and it will be God's best. He was already angry enough. I didn't say it to him. <laughs> I was passed over for that promotion. Everybody in the office knows that was mine. I deserved it. I was ignored. I did all the work. They thanked everybody else but me. No, in all things, in everything, everything that humbles me, everything I enjoy, everything that I don't enjoy, God is at work to make me like Jesus. Now, just look at verse 28 and let me read it to you as it exists in the Greek language which Paul had it written in. This is how it goes. And we know that for those who love God, God is at work in all things for their good. That is for those who are called according to his purpose. And it is his purpose that they be representative of the new creation in the old, that they be conformed to the image of his son. And therefore, in all things, God is working to deliver me from being merely six foot two. That's the reality. The theologians refer to the threefold office of Jesus, his prophet, priest, king. He is prophet. He tells forth the word of God. Indeed, he is the word of God. He is priest, he intercedes, he mediates between God and people. He is king, he rules over all of God's creation. He is the universal ruler. But now I'm in Christ, I have a prophetic ministry, I tell forth the word of God. I have a priestly ministry in Christ, I intercede in his name. And I have a kingly ministry when I'm in Christ. I rule over all things. Isn't that the most comforting, wonderful truth? that everything that happens is within God's province for me, designed to make me like Christ. It's as though I've got a, a, an invisible sieve over me and nothing will come through to my experience that is not intended to make me like Christ. He works in all things for good. We say, well, what if I go out today and my car's stolen outside? Does that mean he approves of theft? No, but God is so in charge that if he could so master and rule over the Assyrian Empire and the Babylonian Empire and those who put his son on the cross and bring ultimate good from it, he can bring good from your car being stolen. When I was in parish, I used to teach at the Presbyterian Ladies College just one morning a week in scripture. In the middle school term, winter term, I used to read to the girls a book. I'd buy 30 books, I'd distribute to them and we'd read together. I think the most impacting book we read in those years was Johnny, the story of the 16-year-old girl who dived into that lake and floated to the surface as a quadriplegic. And there is a moment in that book where Johnny says this, I now realise that God allows what he hates in order to achieve what he loves. Her spiritual wholeness, her eternal life, he allows what he hates in order to achieve what he loves. God is at work in all things. My friend Donald, my mentor in Presbyterian ministry, he saved and scratched and got together money. He used to go and buy his suits from St. Vincent de Paul. He never had a new suit because he put all his money together. He was saving to buy a new Holden car. Finally, he buys the new car. The first time he's ever owned a new car in his life, he brings it home. His young son, Andrew, who was fairly wayward and adolescent, says, oh, Dad, you got the car. Can I take it out on the road, put it through its paces? He knew what that car meant to his father. His father gave him the keys. Two hours later, Andrew rings up, Dad, I put the car around a tree. Now, what would you say if you were Donald? What? You knew what that car meant to me? This is what Donald said. Are you all right, son? What? He cares more about me than that car? Andrew today is a Presbyterian minister. Three weeks ago, I was at a men's convention. I met Andrew's son. And I met the two youngest men at that convention who were Andrew's grandchildren, grandsons. 
grandsons, sons, Andrew, Donald, four generations. He didn't lose it. A car's wrapped around a tree. Are you all right, son? Will God fulfill his purposes? Look at verse 30. And those he predestined, he called them in time. And those he called, he justified them. He set them righteous before him. And those he justified, look, Paul knows that glorification is still in the future, but he puts it as though it's in the past. It is as sure as though it's already been achieved. Those he justified, he also glorified. And yet glory is future. Paul says it's sure. He predestined. He called you. He justified you. And God doesn't start without finishing. He won't leave any job undone. You are totally secure. Our first parish we will we go out in October. It's cotton, it's cotton growing time. Cotton is about that far above the ground. Wheat is in head, almost ready to harvest. Sunday afternoon, we see a great storm come from the north. Huge hailstones as big as golf balls. Never seen hailstones that size. Goes right through the property. We wonder why all in the room are silent, because it is devastating. It would cut the cotton down and you couldn't resow it. The season's ruined. It would cut the head off the wheat. You couldn't get anything out of your harvest. The owner stood to lose a fortune. We go out to our cars when the storm has passed. And notice what the hail has done to the hoods of our cars. And as I'm there, one of the labourers in the farm comes down the street and he says to my friend, the owner, well, the Lord gives and the Lord takes away. And he spits on the ground in front of him. The Lord gives and the Lord takes away. And my friend said, you finish that verse. The Lord gives and the Lord takes away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. How could you say it? Because God is in control of all things. And he's in control of all things for good. Are you eternally secure? Don't doubt God's word that you are. Look at verse 31 and 32. Is there an effective enemy who can thwart the purposes of God? No, Paul says, God is for us. At the justice tribunal, is there a clever enough accuser? Who can cancel us out and disqualify us? Verse 33 to 34. No, it is God who justifies. Is there anything that can frustrate God's purposes? No, look at the options. Paul runs out of descriptions. Verses 37 to 39. He says, don't you realise that when you get to the judgment tribunal, all of the personnel there are for you. God the judge is for you. And God the son is standing at your right hand side. And he's interceding for you on the base of his own work. And so I ask you today, do you know that you're eternally secure? We had a lady in our We Walk congregation every morning when she put her children onto the bus for the 10 kilometer drive into, into, into the town. She'd say the same thing to them every day. Goodbye and remember whose you are. Goodbye, Ruth, remember whose you are. Goodbye, Rachel, remember whose you are. Goodbye, Bruce. Remember whose you are. Remember whose you are. I have a father who has a hidden hand springing from a heart of love. It is a sovereign hand and he is working all things for good to make me like his son, Jesus, whom I love and whom I'm called to know. And I have a Holy Spirit living within me who causes me to remember that I am God's child and to say no to that lower life. And I have a saviour who has brought my past and made it guilt free. We used to live in a house just off the college property and it had a swimming pool. It was a new world to me, swimming pools. But I had to look after it. I got introduced to the world of the pool shop. <laughs> Skimmers, backwater pumps, filters, Creepy crawlies, alkaline buffers, water hardeners, algae starvers. <laughs> and of course, the worst thing that can happen to your pool is if you end up with cloudy water. And sometimes my pool would just get cloudy 
and I put the hardener in and I put the buffer in and I had the creepy crawly going around. What makes this pool get cloudy? But sometimes I get cloudy. The boy creeps back. It shows neglect. I'm too busy. I'm merely six foot two again. God has one agenda item. It is my highest calling. It's your highest calling. It's how you determine whether you are a success. To be conformed to the image of his son. To be like Jesus. Is that how you see life? Is that how you read it? The giraffe has the big view. Romans 8 is the giraffe view. Past what Christ has done. Present what the spirit is doing. Future the assurance that God is in control. To be like Jesus, this hope possesses me. In every thought and deed, this is my aim, my creed, to be like him. Let's pray. None of us, you know our Father, have made it. We are all at different stages of maturity and all at different paces leading to maturity. But how good it is to be reminded that you've made provision for our past, our present and our future. And when we face those things which are so confronting to us, pain, suffering, disease, accident, and we see them in our own lives, our Heavenly Father, we pray that we might remember that yours is a hidden hand, a sovereign hand springing from a heart of love so that we might be conformed to the image of your son, representatives in this old rotting creation of the new creation to come. So have your way in us, we pray, for we ask in the name of our sovereign king, our Lord Jesus. Amen.